felt about transitivity. And uh, I would like to perhaps explain how I got into this, this, uh, this kind of problem. So I was interesting. I was interested in, in uh, uh, diffeomorphism on T3, which are uh, weak, weakly, partially hyperbolic. So they have like a, a splitting. Uh, to one, one strong and one center bundle. And uh, <coughs> in particular, I was interested in, in ergodicity and, and transitivity, these kind of phenomena. And, and then I, I realized, you know, it's perhaps it's better to look at endomorphisms on, on the T2. <coughs> uh, so, so if, for example, if you, if, 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 if in this setting you have a uh, hyperbolic and also, and you have uh, some eigenvalues of this form, for example, then this is somewhat analogous, uh, analogous to looking at uh, any map on, on T2 which has uh, a, uh, a expanding. And one of the reasons why, why this is uh, quite analogous is that here you have, um, there's a construction, which I think most of you know about, where you can, uh, you can define a, um, Something it sometimes is written like this: uh, an inverse inverse limit space, and this inverse limit space it it uh, what is it? It it's it's what what we call uh, solenoidal solenoidal manifold. So it's it's kind of Local, it's a product of a disk by a counter set. One thing, to, one way to look at it is, is to um, think of it as, as a couple of squares. Uh, so this is, this is a square times a counter set. And uh, you glue this part with this part, not, not in the obvious way, but according to some, some uh, homeomorphism on the counter set and here as well, <laughs> which is given by, by the linear part A. And uh, well, you can project, you, you can project to the, so this is, this uh, inverse limit space is the space of orbits with a fixed free orbit. And you can project this to the torus. And if you do so, you, you uh, can look at the fibers of this projection. And these fibers are um, counter sets, and they play a very similar role to, so they are more or like, less like uh, stable, strong stable manifolds. So there, you can so somehow think of this as being weakly partially hyperbolic. Well, nowadays, I, I, I think the other way around, I think, this to me is the, the natural object of, of study. And if I'm able to prove something here, then I look if there's some kind of implementation here. So uh, after thinking about this for some time, I, I uh, kind of flipped my viewpoint. So this is the reason why I started to think about these things. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so what can be said about transitivity? Uh, it's clear uh, information about the linear part itself is not sufficient to say anything because uh, you guessed it, uh, there can be attractors. Every, every homotopy class of uh, maps on the torus can 
contain non-transitive elements just by uh, producing something like this. So you just take some, some balls, let's say some open set U, and you send it to it inside itself. Right? And then you're not transiting. So uh, something more is needed. <laughs> yeah. So what is needed? So that's, that's the kind of open question. So the kind of uh, things that we've been looking for is are results of the form, uh, something, something that guarantees uh, transitivity, of particular robust transitivity. But it should involve it should involve the uh, some information about the linear part. So linear part plus some kind of structure should uh, imply transitivity. The first uh, uh, the first result that that uh, I obtained in this direction was uh, uh, perhaps the most obvious way to avoid having attractors is to suppose that a map is conservative. Now recall that. Conservative in the in the non-invertible setting is a little bit different from in, in the in the uh, uh, invertible setting. So, conservative in the in the invertible non-invertible settings implies that you're expanding volume in the future. You take a small set, you're expanding volume. So. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the pre-image of, of, of any set has the same measure as the, as the, as the image. So this, this uh, result actually works both for, for expanding and, and, and for hyperbolic linear part. Uh, it, yes? Ah, conservative means that it's, it's volume preserving. So uh, the volume or area, you want of, of a pre image of any set, A is already used, of any set is equal to the volume of the set. The, the definition in ergodic theory of invariant measure. The volume is an invariant measure for the map. A in the future expands because it means that if you take some ball and look at the pre images, so if you have two pre images, the sum of these. Of the same area as that one. So you should take a small ball and, and, and iterate it with this time. <laughs> so, a uh, word of caution it's, it's very easy to, uh, when you think about these things, to have uh, the wrong ideas, to have the wrong intuition. I, uh, so, if, if you remember, we have this very strong, very strong uh, result. That F is if is semi conjugated to to A, so it's very tempting to say, uh, "Wow, you know, this this can be used." Yes. No, no, the, the, uh, because we're dealing with non-invertible maps without critical points. Uh, the determinant of A. The modulus of determinant A is always greater than or equal to two. But you could have, of course, uh, maps with one eigenvalue equal to one, for example. That's that's what I would call partial hyperbolic, and the other one equal to two, for example. Then not even the linear, not even the linear one is transitive. No, no, transitive, I mean that you have a dense orbit. So for example, if you take a linear map like this, no, this is not transitive. So this, this, uh, this preserves uh, horizontal, Circle. So 
so, so if you look at linear maps, then, yeah. Yeah, the linear maps you can kind of separate in, in, in the cases where you have an, a unitary eigenvalue and where you have an expanding and or where you have a, a hyperbolic endomorphism. So I, when you have a, if you have a linear part like this, then the linear map is not, is not transitive. So it doesn't make sense to say that every one homotopic to it would be transitive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's recurrent, but not true. No, 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 no. Not at all, very far from it. Now this actually, this works, this is C0. This, work, this works C0, this is purely topological. Uh, <laughs> so I wanna, uh, the, the time when I was working on this, I, I asked some people uh, about what they thought about it and, and the first reaction is always that it's it's trivial because uh, I mean you have a semi-conjugate so so uh, if you take some open set u uh, take some some open set u and then you send it by the semi-conjugacy you get some set some set and then you can iterate it some sometimes by the linear part and then you get everything and then this is the same as as, as iterating like this, and, and and this commutes, so uh, so this is equal to the power. So that that's the naive naive uh, argument, and it's wrong for two reasons. It, it's wrong because uh, there's no a priori reason why why the image of an open set would be an open set, and even if it was, it doesn't. <laughs> It, uh, even if it is, and uh, uh, and you apply this to get to get the whole torus, it doesn't mean it doesn't imply that that uh, it doesn't imply that this is the whole torus. So there's there is a, as I said, it, it's very easy to have wrong intuition. It's never one because I'm supposed, I, so I didn't write the full hypothesis, but I'm supposing uh, the, the setting where F is non-invertible. It's, it's a covering, it's a self cover of degree at least two. The only way to have a, an example where a non-transitive example is if you have an I, A has an eigenvalue plus minus one. <laughs> Yeah. Of a non non expanding, like uh, so, you have this for example. This is uh, an anose of endomorphism. It has uh, two eigenvalues whose product is equal to two. Uh, one is smaller than one, and the other is bigger than one. It's not expanding, no. <laughs> so, uh, so for example, in particular, this this theorem, it, the the proof that you learn in in the first course in dynamical system that expanding maps are are uh, transitive, you actually prove something stronger. Which some people call locally eventually onto. Like if you take any little set and iterate it, eventually it's the whole manifold. Uh, there's no, I mean, th this theorem doesn't prove that. And I, 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 I see no reason to expect why it's true. So uh, I will convince you, at least why it's very far from trivial, by, uh, by an example. So uh, this is R2. So this is, I'm gonna iterate a little ball. It's not so small, by the way, like radius, uh, diameter, a half or something like that. And, and uh, I'm gonna iterate it uh, by a map, which is homotopic to, 
it's homotopic to uh, an expanding map. So it does something like this. You take some, you define a, some horizontal uh, S figure map. So take, this goes to uh, P sine to PY. So this map takes a square and sends it into something like this. Uh, comma y thank you and then you take a map which let's do capital h and then you take a map which does the same but uh, in the other direction uh, So it takes a square and, and does something like this. So both of these are conservative. And then you take uh, A to be uh, our favorite expanding map. And then you take F to be uh, the composition of this. So it's homotopic to, to this guy. Uh, it, it's it, it has a determinant it, it has jacobian four at every point now after only two iterates you get something like this and it goes on no matter how much you iterate uh, the iterates will never contain a big ball the, the naive argument of of trying to iterate a ball and and make it contain everything doesn't work So in fact, uh, maps homotopic to an expanding map can be very crazy. So what I mean by crazy, uh, perhaps unintuitive is a better word. So one thing which we proved recently, uh, me and Pablo Cajasco and Radu Sagin, is that they may have negatively apple spawn. So in particular, this example, I'm, I'm quite convinced that it has. Uh, if you if you change this two to five and make t very big, something like one thousand, we can prove that that it has in fact negatively abnormal spawn. But I think uh, even something like this with uh, with t equal to one, perhaps one and a half, something like that, it, it should also have negatively abnormal spawn. So, uh, and, and the pre-image of, uh, of every point by the standard conjugates is a complicated set. So what's a complicated set? Well, it's something that looks like a Hanoma tract. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, in particular, it contains, uh, it contains arcs of, arbitrarily length and no such things like that. It's a terribly uh, complicated uh, situation. <clears throat> and if you take a, a curve, so if you take a long curve at least and uh, iterate it, you, you get actually the whole, no, you know, you know, sorry, you don't iterate it. You, you look at the image by the semi-conjugacy. The semi-conjugacy takes a curve and maps it to the whole torus. So the so, semi-conjugacy is very ugly. So things that we often, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons which complicates this because it's, it's very hard to even imagine how the semi-conjugacy look like. So, uh, when, once we're fed up with, with conservative, the next step to go is expanding, like, a, a, like we a, a commented before. A, a cons conservative implies expand. expanding. Volume expanding is, is a strictly weaker condition than being conservative. So uh, what can you say about volume expanding? 
uh, well, you have a problem because there may still be a tractor. So how can you have a tractor uh, to expand volume? Well, no problem. So you may have a situation like this. So here is uh, T2. And here is some open set, U. And here's the image of it. This is compatible with being volume expanding. Volume expanding doesn't mean that the, the image of any set it has volume greater than itself, it can. Uh, it just implies that as long as the, the map is injective, it, that holds. So this is very easy to construct an example like this. You take uh, F1 to be a, a map, a doubling map on the, uh, on the on the circle and f2 to be a deformed uh, doubling map on the circle which has an attractor <clears throat> and you say that f2 the derivative at zero is is smaller than one but larger than a half and then you take f to be the product the direct product of the Then you get uh, an invariant stripe and your, your volume expanding, uh, but you still have attractors. <clears throat> now, um, there's some, some difference between this attractor and the first I, I drew here. Uh, uh, so you have something cool that happens for, for uh, volume expanding maps is that whenever you take an open set and iterate it, it gains homology. It, it gives you, uh, it gives you a, it gives you an essential set. So what's an essential set? So you, you is essential if, if it, contains a loop, gamma, uh, not homotopic to a point in T2. So, so for example, this, this is essential and, uh, uh, and this is not. This is this is not essential. Uh, no. Uh, the expand here the expand the expanding part has uh, both eigenvalues are larger than one. And your volume expanding, but it doesn't help. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so uh, again, if you take this ball and iterate it twice, you uh, already can see that you get something uh, which is essential. If you take like this point and this point are the same, the torus. Uh, so, a way of looking at this is. If you translate your uh, your set by a, a, an integer by an element of z two, and it intersects itself, then uh, then your set is is uh, essential. Now, if you look at this particular example, we iterate it once more, uh, still essential. You translate it and it intersects itself. But what if you translate it in a different direction? Well, in this case, it's still uh, it affects itself. That's probably what uh, Sa Salvador Sanata was talking about. Uh, there's this uh, this blue set here is it's doubly essential, but fully essential. 
So what do I mean by that? So it's doubly essential if there are loops which point in different directions. So you have two loops that, that are linearly independent if you look at, at them as, as elements of D2. And <laughs> uh, that's how, that's where this, this new condition of ours enters. We say that a map is strongly volume expanding if the, if the Jacobian is larger than the spectral radius at every point. This only makes sense when the, when the linear part is, is expanding. You can't have this when the linear part is an amorphous. The amorphous. <laughs> uh, and what do we prove in this case? So here there's a, this proposition which started this work uh, actually in another Bayon conference, Lumini. So uh, uh, we prove that if, if uh, you're strongly volume expanding, then if you iterate any set, you get a doubly set. So in particular, this is, this is not possible. You have a strongly volume expanding. And a corollary of that is that if you're strongly volume expanding and you uh, take any two sets and iterate them, they, uh, they will both be doubly essential or fully essential, and therefore they must intersect. So any two fully essential sets on the torus must intersect. If you, have, if you have something like this, so this is an example of a, uh, doubly essential set. And this is another example. Let's try it like this. Now they do intersect. So we get this funny property here that strongly volume expanding implies that any large iterates of two sets intersect in the future. What does that mean? So my first thought was that ah, this implies mixing. <laughs> it doesn't. So I'm still very curious about uh, trying to find out what, what this means. Yes. No. Ah, sorry. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, you're right. So it's for any u and any v. For every u and v, there exists n such that for all n greater than capital N, iterates intersect. That's sorry. E uh, open. I would never use the letters U and B for sets that were not open. <laughs> oh, sorry. N and N and M. Sorry. Thank you very much. <clears throat> ah. Okay. I can give you an example in on the interval still example so let's let's uh, take some invariant set here and make a tenth map and then some expansion so this map is is uh, uh, mixing inside here and this is an attractor so everything everything falls in there and then it's mixing uh, that's, I believe this is more or less something like that should always be true. So one thing that this implies is that you cannot have two attractors. There cannot be two uh, trapping reads, two, two disjoint trapping reads. Everything will have to intersect. But I do believe, and I have a, I have a sketch of a counterexample, even in, in the setting we're working in, 
uh, but I haven't been able to verify that it's strongly volume expanding, but I think it is. Uh, if, if I'm right, uh, there, there are examples where, where it's not transitive. I guess you have something like, uh, uh, like the, uh, the non-wandering set is uh, transitive, uh, problem mixing, something like that. That's what I believe. You do get some things. The, the, the pre-orbit the, the pre of the non-wandering set is dense. Uh, you get the generic points, in the residual sense, have uh, dense, stable sets, like the, the stable sets, not they're not necessarily stable manifolds, but the stable set of, of generic points are, are dense, but not every point. If you had every point, you would be able to apply the classical. It would be like having a minimal unstable foliation. You could get transitivity, but you don't. So, Uh, what, what can we do? We, uh, we proved that, okay. So after a while we, we gave up on this general setting and we said, okay, let's, let's try to prove something. And then uh, we, uh, we said that, okay, if you have a map which is partially hyperbolic, then and strongly volume expanding, and we consider the case of uh, of uh, integer eigenvalues. Actually, this is in some sense the hardest case. So, if you see this this stripe, is not so hard. To, I mean, it's not so easy to to find a counterexample in the case, for example, when the eigenvalues are rational. So, let me put that as a question. I think this is a very good question question does if if you have uh, irrational irrational so I'm still in the oh, actually it doesn't need to be linear part uh, expanding and uh, if you have irrational eigenvalues of, of the linear part and F is volume expanding. <clears throat> Are you transitive? All right. Uh, does, does volume, simple volume, not strong volume expand? Expansion. imply transitivity, <clears throat> nothing else, no, no partial hyperbolicity. So we think we can do this with partial hyperbolicity, but uh, and only simple volume expansion. But uh, I feel that it's probably, it, I think it's true uh, in any case, I, I would guess the answer is yes, but I don't know. Uh, so in a sense, integer eigenvalues is, is kind of a tricky part because you have you have situations like this. Or at least we know we have situations like that. So what so what is a what is a partial hyperbolic endomorphism? <laughs> so uh, uh, if this is uh, beyond uni uh, uniform. Hyperbolicity conference. I, I imagine that everyone knows about partial hyperbolicity, but not necessarily for endomorphism. So, uh, uh, an endo is partially hyperbolic if it has an F invariant unstable cone field. So it, it's one of the ways that you can define uh, partial hyperbolicity in, 
in the invertible setting as well. So you have some point X and you have some cone field and uh, you have some, some point F of X and you have the associated cone field here. And if you map this cone with a derivative, you should get uh, some, some cone inside here and you should expand. You should expand uh, the vectors. Now, one, one of the differences is that uh, here, if you have another, if you have another point that maps to the same, then uh, the image of the unstable cone field here should be something different. What that means is that you don't really have an invariant unstable direction. You do have an invariant central direction, which is the vectors that never fall into this cone, but no invariant unstable direction. Right. <laughs> uh, there is a similar theorem by, it's similar in statement, but very, very different in, in its method of proof uh, by uh, Kana and Raoul and and Jagang Yang about uh, uh, diffeomorphisms on G3. So they have uh, something, they, they, they require C2 because they use, uh, they use uh, the Apple of exponent, they use Gibbs U states and, uh, and that kind of machinery. And they, 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 allow, they allow you to have uh, equality. So, so they have the, 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 the unstable, central unstable Jacobian. They want it to be larger than the largest eigenvalue, but they, they allow it to be varying in a, a small set of points, and they they get minimal minimal uh, uh, strong st uh, minimality of the strong foliation. They get sensitivity. Now, oh, uh, all this. Well, all, all the arguments that we use, me and Wagner Ranter, they, they rely on a theorem by Blitzfeld, which is a very old, very elementary theorem and very nice. So it says that if you have a set uh, in, let's say, R2, so doesn't have to be open, but let's think about it as an open set. Then you can find a grid, the translation of, of Z2, so that the number of points in this set, in this intersection, et cetera, is at least as big as the volume, or the, in, the integer part of the volume of the set, plus one. <laughs> so this kind of a pigeonhole principle, the, the proof is elementary, uh, at least now when we have uh, measure theory, it's, it, it's like a one-liner, two-liner. Uh, but it's very beautiful. And uh, we can use it to prove, for example, this, this, uh, this proposition. So how do you prove this proposition? By picture. You take a set, you take a set U, let's say in the in R2, and you iterate it. <laughs> it will be contained. So it's, I don't know, let's say it looks something like this. It will be contained in some big box, like a big square, whose sides are of the order the largest, uh, the spectral radius, the largest eigenvalue to the end. Uh, the volume of the iterate, the volume of the iterate is of order 
lambda to the n, where lambda is strictly larger than the spectral radius. So after some time, this volume is bigger. And then by Blitzfeld, it contains lots of points in a grid. And these points, um, they, all, they don't fit on one row because, because, because this is bigger than this. So by the pigeonhole principle, there must be some, some curves that, that join uh, points in one direction and in some other direction, for example, like this. So you get homology in two directions. <laughs> And uh, in the, let's go here. So how do you prove the theorem? That in, you prove it with a similar picture, but you have restriction on how these sets can grow. So uh, uh, in this setting, it's been proved by Andy Hammerlin and, and Paul, that uh, the maps are, are uh, they have a central foliation and they're leaf conjugated to the central part. So if you take some, instead of taking, so, so, let's, so let's, let's take some, some set, which is foliated by central stable manifold. And you can see, let's take some set uh, and iterate it. If you iterate it, uh, after a long time, it will, will grow. I don't know how it will grow, but it will grow. And by Blitzfeld theorem, for the same kind of argument, this is still a union of, of central manifolds. And by, uh, by Blitzfeld theorem, there are many points here. There, there are more points than this is long. So uh, at, at some point, you must have a situation like this. At two points, uh, you can linearize this because it's leaf conjugated. So you can say these two points are actually on the same, they are on the same, uh, they're on the same central curve. So you have a stripe. And this stripe, if you pro project on the, onto the torus, it's something like this, so this f n times, and then you iterate it k times more, and it covers the whole torus. So it's actually uh, locally eventually onto. So then if this is b, then f n plus k b is the whole torus. So that's, that's how uh, partial hyperbolicity helps us to get transitive. Okay. Uh, uh, there are some simulations, but I don't think uh, we have time. So uh, thank you very much. So questions? Do you have any kind of stability for linear endomorphisms that are expanding? Uh, like C1, let's say. Ex expanding maps are structurally stable and so on. Always. Okay. Yes. Uh, but here, uh, we're interested in maps that are only homotopic to expanding maps. So the map itself is not expanding. So, no, there is. Uh, uh, this is okay. I didn't mention, but this is robust transitivity because all the conditions are robust, but no, nothing like structural stability, nothing like that. Okay. Excuse me, may I ask a question? Uh, from online audiences. Sorry, who's talking? Uh, uh, it's me, uh, uh, I mean. Ah, online. Okay, yes, online. <laughs> wow. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, beyond transitivity, uh, is there any result about ergodicity of this kind of maps? Um, no. So the 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 best I can give you is the, the example that I, I was talking about here. And let's let's go back. This is the first simulation. Uh, this one, this is part of a class of, of maps that we, we can show the other members of this class. If you have if you increase the parameters and so on, uh, we get uh, maps that are non-uniformly hyperbolic and and uh, ergodic, stably ergodic, C1 stably ergodic. But that's a particular setting. Uh, for example, in general, like in this theorem, uh, this theorem here, uh, I have absolutely, no, I have no idea. That's one of the mysteries also. I mean, there is no, I, I, I've been talking to people who have, had lots of different ideas, you know, you should construct a Markov partition or whatever, but nothing seems to work. So uh, no, I, I know nothing about it. And of course the, the maps in theorem A aren't, uh, they aren't, uh, they aren't conservative. So, so uh, you can't really ask if they're ergodic, but you can ask uh, other physical measures and so on. And, and yeah, I was talking to Bruno and, and these maps, the maps in theorem A are uh, essentially mostly expanding. Uh, they have a positive Lyapunov exponent on the Gibbs you made. So uh, you can probably say something there. Perhaps it's a unique physical measure. But in general, no, don't know much. Thank you. Can you explain quickly in the picture why do the eigenvalues need to be integer? Uh, <laughs> um, so this is the cause of this. this the, the fact that you get this stripe. Yeah. Uh, if they are not, you don't get this on the same, you don't get this on the same, uh, on the same map. You, you get something like this. <laughs> so uh, so the, the two points are not on the same, on the same uh, center, like center and link. And then it, it's not clear if you iterate them, it's not clear why it becomes everything. But we think, uh, well, after uh, like last week, we've been talking and, and we think we know how to do it with another kind of proof uh, in the irrational eigenvalue case. Uh, and it's, it's more general because it only uses volume expansion, not strong volume expansion. Okay, so that's some nothing again.